Josh Raven here with the Daily Dart at IEM Cologne League of Legends event and I'm joined by what should be a familiar face now to you Europeans. He of course left North America and joined the, uh, the best region in the West we should say and that is Prolly, head coach of H2K. But that may not have been because there was a time in the off season when you did send out a tweet, we have confirmed this pre-interview, where you sent out a tweet saying you were maybe looking at some options, you have come back to H2K with this new lineup. Is that what's made you come back, the promise of this new lineup, or were you always considering coming back anyway? Um, I was always considering coming back. Like, uh, I know you shouldn't be like mixing business with pleasure and all that stuff, but like Odo and Ryu are like really great guys, and I have really good personal relationships with them, so in a way, if I were to leave them, I feel like I wouldn't have done them justice because I originally started coaching them with kind of like a goal and like technically we made that goal getting worlds but it's like you know the hunger isn't satisfied by that kind of thing so it's kind of like I still want to do things with Odo and Ryu and kind of push them more into the spotlight because I think they don't get enough credit than they do right now. So I was always uh, considering staying just based on that and the biggest turning point was when we started talking with you know like Vander and Yonkos and Forgiven and kind of um, having more talks with them and kind of feeling them out as players and how they would fit with everyone else and the more and more I thought about it and like kind of theory crafted what a good roster would be it, I kept coming back to like this would be a pretty sick roster to have like we already have like top and jungle high, or sorry jungle and support having really good synergy which has been the meta game for the last year is how well they can move around the map together we have like a super mechanical AD carry which is you know that's always what I think AD carriers need you know having a team player AD carry is nice but I think the highest mechanics possible is always going to be the greatest. And then I already had a mid and top who was like, I could count on already and like I already trusted. So it seemed just kind of like a no-brainer. I almost, you know, wouldn't find a better deal on another team uh, in terms of roster. So it just seemed too, too good to say no and be like, nah, we shouldn't pick up these players. I'm just going to leave this. Like, if we can get these players, like, let's do this and I'll, and I'll stay with the team. Obviously in the offseason there have been some teams going through changes that haven't come out on the good end. Teams like Elements, still not sure if they have a roster, Rockat as well, uh, Gravity in North America. Was there a fear at all when you lost those three players in Kasing, uh, Lulex and Kianan that H2K could be left in a similar situation or were you always convinced that you were going to get the top talents? Yeah, um, something that I'm definitely not good at is like talent scouting. That's just not a strength I have and as a coach you should be able to like judge talent pretty easily. Um, but for me the way I judge talent is it requires a lot more like personal relationship with the person and like interaction. It's hard to judge on the outside because there's too many like variables and hypotheticals and I'm someone who's going to overthink it. So I really need to like know them and have real conversations and then I can narrow it down if they're good or not. So when uh, everything started falling apart I really didn't have any backups because yeah I'm not one to be looking for who would be a good replacement and such like, stuff like that and at the time I wasn't aware like you know Rokat was in the place it was, and uh, I honestly, Forgiven was always a thought in the back of my mind. I'll be honest about that, though. Uh, so it really came down to like when everything was going wrong. Is like, well, I guess I'll just not coach next split or something. Like I really hope someone noticed that I'm like working my ass off. Like, you know, it's hard sometimes to get recognition as a coach because it's really up to like what people want to decide to give the coach credit, you know. If the players don't talk good about you, like, no one else knows what the coach is doing. So, it's really on them to, like, be impacted by me or not. I guess me to have an impact on them and then them to, you know, believe it to, to be true. So, yeah, there was a lot of panic for a while and a lot of crappy days where I'm just sitting there like, I hope I have enough money to just do nothing for a while and maybe get picked up later. But the good news is you will be coaching next year and we will get into some LCS questions in a while but let's start off here in Cologne for IEM. It started off fairly well, you managed to secure the 2-1 victory over Cloud9. It didn't look so good after the first game, there were some uh, d dodgy moments in the second and third game but you pulled it through. Uh, what did you make of those games considering I believe you only had like two or three days practice coming in? Mm -hmm. Yeah we only had a, a couple days with the team so like I haven't gotten to like influence the team as much as I need to right now. Uh, the good thing is we had the basis of like Odo and Ryu, so even though I couldn't like impact five people, like those two could kind of spread the word through the team it, during the game. So I had a lot of confidence in that even though we didn't have practice. Um, the games in Cloud9 were really hard. Uh, for a while we actually didn't even know what support they were going to play, like we knew really late what side we were going to be, and 
at the time we weren't sure of what to make of their team because right now the only scouting is like solo queue and since solo queue is like you could literally play other stuff just to trick people or like other stuff because you just like playing in solo queue you can't determine their solo queue record means what they play in competitive so it's really hard to scout them um, they haven't played in a long time and Rush being like a solo queue player like cool he plays nearly all the time will he actually play in competitive because it's less of a competitive champion so there's a lot of like back and forth like what is this team going to be and I think throughout the series it became really obvious that High needed to be the engage because he is a shot caller and we kept giving him Alistar we didn't really take it away from him and so during the third game like luckily we were able to come back in that second game and the third game we were like alright yeah we should just take this easy engage support that he has, like it's like you know, range, stun, knock up, crap, like that's just he's gonna be able to get the engage if he wants it. So we ended up banning that out, and it took away like their biggest playmaker. And then the game became a lot more about like our pace because we could watch, you know, maybe Nivea can make plays and stuff, but like you know, Nivea is not gonna do like too much. MF's not, maybe Shin Flash Taunt. So it limited their like capabilities of engaging and kind of like surprising us so it was a lot more calculated of a game to like take an end well I was going to leave this one for later but you did briefly mention it about kind of these off-season tournaments after rosters change and new uh, changes to the game are coming in uh, how much value do you think should be put on these tournaments Cause obviously there's a lot of people a lot of the fans placing immense weight on the teams in this tournament like Cloud9 lost some NA fans are saying oh Cloud9 are bad now but what, what do you think about that? Do you think off-season tournaments tend to be looked at too much in terms of team skill because of all these changes? Yeah, I think they are. Um, mostly because, like, so Cloud9 today played one style, which was, like, you know, highs they engage. They haven't showed Bunny Fufu yet, but they've played one style so far. I mean, they only had three games to show a style, so first of all, like, you can't write them off because you haven't seen what else they can do yet. And on the same side, like, if we were the ones that lost, you wouldn't really see a big style yet. You wouldn't see like, oh, we're giving, forgiven all the farm, or like, we're doing this. It's like, yeah, we still haven't like developed yet. We haven't had time to, and, you know, basically we haven't had practice to, or been together like just numbers wise, like known each other long enough. So things like that, it's too hard to kind of judge a team and write them off. Cause I still think, yeah, Cloud9 could literally be a surprise for next split completely. This doesn't, you know, knock them down a peg or anything like that. And this technically doesn't knock us up a peg at all. Cause we're basically two teams like trying to surprise each other. That's really what this uh, tournament comes down to is like who can, you know, hold on for the first game, hopefully hold on for the second game and the third game adapt faster. That's kind of what it is right now. It's not going to be straight up like this team's better because they won now, even though I know a lot of people are going to be like, but you won the series, you have to be better. It's like, nah, this is a, there's a lot of RNG in league right now. So I'll put it that way. It's like Hearthstone. Yeah. Wow, that's uh, that's going to get some interesting comments. Uh, but we'll get towards the end of the interview now. We'll go towards the LCS next year, Spring 2016. Now obviously, there's a lot of new rosters in Europe. Yeah. Teams like Fnatic, Origin, uh, the new Vitality, and of course H2K, all putting together very strong rosters. I mean, what are your goals for the Spring Split and maybe the 2016 season as a whole? I know that's a very big question, yeah. but I'm putting you under the spotlight now, probably. Mm. Well, this is kind of like my chance to prove my worth, I guess, as a coach. Like, I did get, uh, uh, with H2K, third place for two splits, which is, like, kind of a nice thing. But in my eyes, that's still a very average uh, placing. Uh, sitting there with the, since we did have, like, a good roster, it just seemed like that's where we would have ended up eventually, like, with or without me almost, in a way. So now it's kind of my time to, like, I'm picking kind of a hard roster, to do like like forgiven is always like you know rumored to have these terrible conflicts and stuff like that then you know like Yankos and Vander like Rolcat wasn't able to perform for a long time so you know there are, people have doubts about them like you know people say they're overrated or underrated to an extent so I'm like playing with this roster of players that I feel like haven't been represented the way they are you know same thing with Odo and Ryu I feel like all five of these players don't get the recognition they deserve and this is my time to actually do it so at the end of the split if all these players are revered as like top in the role, then I would have done my job. And at the same time, going to Worlds would be cool too.